Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claudia Sternbeck. I'm head of academic programs at the UCL European Institute, UCL's head of research, collaboration and debate on Europe. Um, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you today to discuss a very important topic and to celebrate a new book just out with UCL, um, University, UCL Press um, called Families and Food in Hard Times. Um, it is by uh, Dr. Rebecca O'Connell and Professor Julia Brannan um, here at UCL, who are researchers at the Thomas Coram Research Unit at the UCL Institute of Education. Rebecca is reader in the sociology of food and families, and she was the principal investigator on the study on which this book is based, an ERC study on which, on, on which she, I'm sure she'll tell you more about. Julia is a Merita Professor of the Sociology of the Family and a fam Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. She was Senior Researcher and an Advisor to the Families in Food in Hard Times research team. They're joined today by Baroness Ruth Lister of Berteset. Baroness Lister Ruth is Emerita Professor of Social Policy at Loughborough University and um, she's also the author of Poverty, um, the second edition of which is being released this year. She's also honorary president of the Child Poverty Action Group and as well as um, co-chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Poverty. Um, um, I, our other discussants then are Vasco Ramos, um, who is a research fellow at the in so Social Science Institute at the University of Lisbon. He's a member of the team that carried out the research um, on which this book is based um, and um, worked together with colleagues at, at his institute, Monica Truninger, Sonia Cardoso, Fabio Augusto and Karen Wall. Um, Dr. Celia Skuland is a um, research, senior researcher at, at Consumption Research Norway, SIFO at the Oslo Metropolitan University in Norway. She's a member of the research team and led the research in Norway assistant by Anina Friesland. And uh, finally, we hear from Imogen Bishop, um, uh, Imogen Richmond Bishop, apologies Imogen, um, who is the Right to Food Coordinator at SUSTAIN, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, and is the Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic um, Equity at the London School of Economics. Imogen was an expert member of the, of the Studies Advisory Group. We'll first be hearing from Rebecca and Julia on the book and the research, and then from, from our other speakers. And we'll also um, have um, leave time to hear from you in the audience um, in, in the later part of the seminar. So Rebecca and Julia, please tell us about this exciting project. Thank you so much, Claudia, and um, UCL's European Institute for hosting this event. And thank you to our co-presenters um, for speaking today and for you, to you for joining us. We are we are honoured and delighted that you're with us. Um, we hope you've had a chance to look at the book or you will do shortly after the event. Um, I have got a few more people to thank in a moment but before I do that I wanted to just spend a few minutes um, saying a few words by way of introduction. First about why food matters. Um, and second, about the context of the research and why we wrote this book. Then I'll hand over to Professor Julia Brannan, who will share some of what we found. So to begin with a word about food and why it matters. Well, food is fundamental. In the first place, it's material and it has material consequences on people's bodies, on their everyday lives, and on their opportunities to contribute to and benefit from the prosperity of the societies in which they live. It's also material in the sense that it's a resource. It must be accessed, managed and transformed into meals. In families, this work is most often done by mothers. At the same time as it's material, food is also, of course, deeply symbolic. Eating is the way in which we take in or incorporate and are incorporated into the world. So it mediates our sense of who we are, where we belong and what we're worth. As Charles Dickens recognised in much of his writing, including the book from which we've borrowed the title, food is a powerful expression of social status and the social order. This multi-dimensional nature of food 
means that, especially in wealthy societies, food poverty, being unable to feed ourselves and our children properly, results not only in hunger and malnutrition, but also social exclusion and feelings of shame. For children and young people, especially, being unable to eat the same food and share the same experiences as their friends is particularly painful, as the book discusses. These ways of thinking about food and poverty matter because, as Ruth Lister writes in her recently updated book, Poverty, the way in which social, social problems are conceptualised, defined and measured are highly relevant to the measures that are taken to address them. They are therefore political. These ways of thinking about food and poverty also set the terms for how we set out to research and understand them, which is what I'll briefly turn to next and Julia will expand upon in a moment. So the project was conceived and funded in the wake of the last major global crisis, sometimes referred to as the Great Recession, that began in 2008 and was primarily caused by deregulation in the financial industry. In this context, some governments introduced so-called austerity measures that were ostensibly designed to reduce financial deficits and in reality, reduce the generosity of welfare states and people's expectations of them, as Julia will mention. At the same time, there were global fluctuations in food prices of course, these had the biggest impact on the lowest income families for whom food represents a large proportion of their budgets. Some describe this situation as a perfect storm. National and international media were reporting increasing numbers of children arriving at school hungry. Food banks handing out parcels to, and families have been forced to choose between heating and eating. In recent years, campaigners, notably Marcus Rashford, have drawn public attention to children's experiences of food in low-income families in the UK. But in 2014, when we began the research, few studies sought to explore children's perspectives. And there is still little research that examines what goes on within households in international perspectives. So as researchers at the Thomas Corvum Research Unit, which special, specialises in policy relevant research on children and families, and as sociologists and anthropologists with an interest in comparative approaches, we set out to, to address this gap. We adopted a realist approach and a multi-level research design using a mix of quantitative and qualitative methods. The research team carried out secondary analysis of large scale data and in-depth interviews with young people aged 11 to 15 years and their parents, usually their mothers, in 133 families in the three different countries, the UK, Portugal and Norway. These countries were selected to provide for a contrast of contexts in relation to conditions of austerity. So both the UK and Portugal made substantial cuts to welfare and benefits from around 2010. By contrast, Norway, with its sovereign wealth fund buffer, was less affected by the financial crisis and didn't impose austerity measures. And there are other differences, of course, between the countries and Julia, Vasco and Celia will discuss some of these in their talks. In the book, we examine and compare food and eating in cases of low income families set in multiple layers of social context, unemployed lone mother families, dual parent working families, families in which parents have irregular migration status. We also take a look at how families manage in the context of long term and more recent low income. We compare the different types of resources to which they have access and they draw upon. And in these ways, we try to make sense of and understand the difference that social context made to food and eating. So before I hand over to Julia, who's going to share something of what we found and take a long view in reflecting on the topic of researching crises, I want to 
finish up my part by taking this opportunity to thank some people. And I'm sorry if this sounds like an award acceptance speech, but I think it's important to do formally here. So first of all, we, of course, we want to thank the children and the families who took part in the study. And we hope the book does their stories justice. We also want to thank and acknowledge the research team and their respective research centres. So TCRU um, in the UK, Abigail Knight, Charlie Owen, Antonia Simon and Laura Hamilton. And in Portugal at the Institute of Social Sciences, Monica Twaninger, Sonia Cardoso, Fabio Augusto, Karen Wall and Vasco Ramos, who's with us today. And at SIFO, Consumption Research Norway, Celia Skuland, who's here, and Anina Friesland. Thank you also to Penny Meller and Cecile Bremont for their administrative support, the European Research Council for funding the study, UCL Press for publishing the book, and finally, all of the members of the studies advisory group. Um, I don't have time to name everyone, but I do want to especially thank the chair, Professor Liz Dowler, a public academic whose work over the decades has greatly influenced and continues to shape current debates and action on food poverty in the UK and the global north. So now I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Julia Brannan, another leading figure, as most of you will know, in the sociology of the family, as well as the field of research methodology. She is the book's co-author and was senior researcher and research advisor to the study. Over to you, Julia. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'll just say a few words about crises. Um, they take place at global level, state, organisational, family and individual. But at whatever the level, they reveal the ties that bind their constituent parts and the cleavages that divide them. And this book focuses on the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. I think it's worth reflecting on, for a moment on how earlier crises um, have lagged effects. They affect particular groups more than others and are best witnessed generationally. For example, the 1930s Great Depression, as shown in Glenn Elder's American cohort study, had the greatest and most long lasting effects on the lives of young people aged 15 to 25. And the 1930s crisis also intensified a growing precariat in America. In this book, we've demonstrated the more immediate material effects on income and food poverty of the 2008 crisis on those who were already the worst off. And now we're witnessing how this global crisis is being compounded by another, by the COVID-19 pandemic. In our analysis of international quantitative data, the SILK, we found that the types of families with children who were most adversely affected by food poverty were in the UK, lone parent families in Portugal, where poverty rates are generally higher, lone parent and couple families were equally likely to be food poor. In Norway, by contrast, where poverty rates are, are very low, lone parent families were again most at risk. The qualitative research of our 133 families fleshed out this picture. In the UK, lone mothers reliant on benefits were most at risk of food poverty, many from a migration background, in a context in which a conservative coalition government had from 2010 imposed stringent cuts to benefits and public services. However, the food poor in the United Kingdom also include working families, especially those in low paid work, often on zero hours contract. And suffering the worst conditions and greatest food poverty were women and children whose leave to remain in Britain had expired and were not permitted to work or to claim public funds. They both went hungry and were destitute. In Portugal, 
Those at greatest risk of food poverty included first or second generation migrants as well as white Portuguese and their food poverty erode, rose in a context of low benefit rates and government spending cuts that had resulted from the EU's imposition of austerity me measures in Portugal following the 2008 crisis. In Portugal, wages tend to be low, especially for those in the informal economy in which many of those in our study had worked. While Norway was little affected by the banking crisis, um, and it's, it's a country that's relatively egalitarian, Nonetheless, we found some families to be food poor, especially new migrants who'd arrived under the refugee quota program. And because of Norway's demands for a high skilled uh, labour force, many are subject to either of these migrants are subject to unemployment or underemployment. This means they're only eligible for basic levels of benefit. So parents there find feeding their children difficult, especially in the absence of a school meal service and because of the very high cost of food. I'll say a few words about doing research on food poverty. Asking parents and children what it's like not having enough to eat isn't, isn't ethical or methodologically sound. However, some children did mention being embarrassed by poverty or they talked about the injustices of social inequality, but they also suggested that they didn't admit to others that their families were poor or found ways of concealing it. They made excuses to their friends for not taking part on social occasions. Asking people about food practices is not met methodologically straightforward as, as, as we, we know. They're not, food practices aren't easily recalled or reflected on. On the other hand, getting by on a tight food budget is something that low-income mothers think about every day. And as our book shows, some took pride in telling us about the ways that they were resourceful. In studying food poverty, we sought to create a realist language of description. We wanted in Weber's terms, both to understand and to explain. So we drew on a range of secondary data and we used a variety of primary research methods to empirically observe food poverty and food provisioning. Even so, these approaches are inevitably incomplete or partial, but there's always more going on that we're able to detect with our theories and methods or that participants are aware of. At the micro level, as Rebecca said, we conceptualized households as resource units. We looked at household income sources and expenditure food and their food budgets, including estimates um, of these in relation to national budget standards. Almost all the families in the study were spending less than the family budget standard for families of a similar type and size. We looked at ways of accessing cheap and free food, also drawing on our field work on the field workers' knowledge of the local communities. In the UK, only a minority use food banks, somewhat surprising given the third sector's increasingly taking over the welfare state. In Portugal, charities have long provided food for poor families, as Vashko will mention, including cooked food, and these were frequently used by families. In Norway, a few such charities exist, but they tend to be a leftover from the days before the welfare state. Our conceptual framing of food poverty also encompassed parents and children's capacities to socialize around food and buy food 
in the context of vanishing opportunities for children to earn money in their spare time. I'm sorry, we don't have time to talk about that. Um, and as Rebecca said, we, we looked at the role of school meals. We looked at, we also looked at mother's customary cuisines, their menus and their cooking facilities. In order to create uh, or generate explanation um, as well as description, we adopted a comparative approach, one that avoids methodological nationalism and takes account of multiple spaces and places. We compared, as far as was feasible, similar types of households in the different study contexts in order to examine the conditions that make a difference to surviving on a low income. At the national level, we found that the provision of school meals, how they're funded and delivered, whether they're subsidized or free, could mitigate food poverty. We found that the availability, cost and quality of school food varied strikingly across the countries. In Portugal, as Vasco will talk about in a minute, children were provided with a free three course school meal that for almost all was free and subsidized in our sample. This made a substantial contribution to their daily diets and it supplemented or sometimes substituted for the lack of food at home. In Norway, children typically bring their own uh, packed lunch to school, um, which adds to the financial costs, especially for parents who've got large families. In the UK, only half the children in the UK sample received a free school meal. Four were ineligible because their families had no recourse to public funds and the others because their parents were in low paid jobs. But even the young people with access to a free school meal said they found the meal allowance insufficient to buy enough food to satisfy their appetite. And some of them said that the system was stigmatizing. At the MISO level, um, we found that locality could make a difference to accessing cheap or free food, depending on whether um, parents had access to food banks, to munici municipal services, to street markets, small um, ethnic shops, possibilities for growing or obtaining homegrown produce, and the cost of transport. Each of these could affect how mothers managed. In Oslo, for example, where a majority of the sample in Norway lived, the city's accessibility to the Swedish border was a key resource, especially for the migrants. Many made a monthly journey to stock up on halal meat and other products that they could take home and freeze. Nonetheless, whatever the local context, it was clear that mothers, as the main managers of food poverty, found that living hand to mouth was very hard work. Informal social networks were also a focus of the study with some families pooling their resources but many lacked kin living in the city or local area or even in the country. The ways in which these different layers of social reality intersect and are entwined in time and space offer, we think, a nuanced and complex basis for making Paris comparisons between families, between other types of social institutions and between other groups of relationships. They help to explain differences and similarities across multiple sites. This language of description, as we call it, uh, drawing on Basil Bernstein's use of the term, is a prerequisite for creating a language of redescription that points to political and policy solutions, both to poverty and to food poverty. 
thank you all. And I want to say it was great to work with you team and with you, my co-author. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you, Rebecca, for a fascinating insight into this, uh, this amazing um, project and a wonderful book that I really encourage everyone to read. It's available for free on the UCL Press website and is a great um, read. I really recommend everyone having a look at it. Um, if you're in the audience, um, you're very welcome to put your questions into the Q&A already as they arise, and I'll give you a chance, or as many of you a chance as possible, to put them in person in the later part. Ruth Lister, Baroness Lister, please. Okay, thank you, and thanks very much for the invitation to contribute, and um, very much welcome the book, <clears throat> and I would endorse what Claudia said about hoping that participants will read it because it's well worth reading home going. Um, it provides a fine grained analysis uh, which gives texture uh, and meaning to the statistics and to the discussions around food poverty and insecurity that are happening at present. Um, so while I think it's an important contribution to the academic literature, um, it also throws light on current political debate. Uh, and that that's what, here in the UK, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, child, food, child, food, child food poverty in particular has been in the political spotlight over the past year, not least in thanks to um, the work of Marcus Rashford, who's already been mentioned. I mean, he's, be, he's become like the sort of patron saint of, uh, people who are concerned about child poverty in the UK. I mean, I'm not sure whether there's anything like this in other uh, European countries where a footballer has played such an important role. Um, also, there's been a succession of reports from the Trussell Trust, which is the main food bank provider, though not the sole food bank provider. Um, and really, I think food banks have become a symbol of much that has gone wrong, that, that Quite often they're used as an indicator of the extent to which uh, there is food insecurity and poverty and, uh, and increasingly among children. Uh, and tomorrow, as it so happens, there's a five hour debate in the House of Lords on um, a select committee report on food, uh, poverty and health and health and the environment. And a good chunk of that report, as some of you will know, is um, devoted to food poverty. So uh, I'm planning, well, I am down to speak in that debate and I'm planning to make a reference to this book in the debate. So you'll get a little mention in Hansard. Um, the book underlined why food is so important. And I was going to quote from it, but, <clears throat> but Rebecca has, has done that, or I mean, has made the, 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 the case so well already. So I don't need to do that. But, and so it's understandable that a lot of the attention in, in the last year or so has been on food and food poverty, food insecurity. But the book also illustrates um, a key conclusion of the House of Lords report that food in insecurity is a symptom of poverty itself. Um, and Poverty itself, as um, I and others have argued, it is experienced in, certainly according to Robert Walker and colleagues' research, as shameful in whatever country you're in, in whatever context, poverty uh, is all too often experienced as shameful. Uh, but they also, the book also um, illustrates, sorry, um, and the clear, also that's a clear message from, say, the Trussell Trust, uh, in the reliance on food banks is not a question about the inaccessibility of food, but it's because people have, too many people have inadequate incomes to be able to buy a decent diet um, and, and to, in a growing number of cases, to keep them from hunger. Um, and those inadequate incomes have been made worse by social security cuts in this country particularly uh, partly benefit freezes, but also cuts that have particularly targeted larger families of children. Um, so while food does have a special significance, I think it's important that we 
don't forget that food poverty is about poverty itself. Um, and so it's, it's kind of getting keeping a balance, I think, in the public debate between, between the two, two aspects of it. And I think it's interesting that, um, and as Julia said, that majority of the, the, the um, families to whom you talked in the UK hadn't used food banks. So it shows that while we're used, we, I'm using we in sort of broad sense, using food banks as an indicator of growing poverty and food insecurity, actually it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and it makes you wonder how many more uh, there are who are not turning to food banks because of shame or what, for whatever reason, there may be practical reasons. There were a few specific points I wanted to just bring out from um, the, the book. One is a very strong emphasis on gender, which I've made uh, gen gender dimension, which is an important reminder of the ways in which poverty is gendered, um, including the hidden work of managing poverty uh, among mothers that Julia talked about, both in lone parent families and in two parent families, um, particularly, I think, in managing food poverty. Uh, and that's too often overlooked in political debate. Uh, the extent to which lone mother households are among the most deprived, and in the UK, again, that reflects how they've been hardest hit by both cuts to social security and to uh, local social um, spending. Uh, and it got me thinking that perhaps, you know, I'm thinking about sort of media debate, political debate in the UK, and perhaps we've rather lost sight of the extent to which lone mothers are bearing a lot of the burden. Um, and I'm not sure, quite sure why that is, but um, that's something we may want to discuss um, at the end. Um, and one aspect of that that's brought out in the, in the book is the depth of poverty among lone parent families and others. Um, and this is an issue which is kind of gradually coming onto the political agenda. The Social Metrics Commission Drew, drew attention to this question of the depth of poverty is of growing significance. The latest official statistics show that two thirds of the growing number of children in poverty could be classified as being in deep poverty. Um, and um, a recent uh, uh, article in, in CPAG's journal Poverty by colleagues from Leeds University uh, brought out just how far as children of black, minor, um, black Asian and other minority backgrounds um, who are at the greatest risk among children of deep poverty. And the book brings out also the racialized nature of poverty. Um, and it demonstrates a, in painful descriptions, uh, families subject to the no recourse to public funds rule, um, who experience particularly deep poverty uh, and hunger and I just wanted to quote one child who's quoting that. I mean, I, I'd read it before because I think, I think you, some of this was used in CP, a CPAG book as well. And it, it really tell very telling as a child who talked about severe pain in their stomach because, of, because they weren't entitled to free school meals. And it says, like I got stabbed with a knife and it's still there. I mean, it's just such a vivid description of what that constant hunger must be like for children and, and how it completely messes up any idea of their education. Um, and although um, some no recourse to public funds families have been included in the school meal scheme during the pandemic, which is welcome, it is only some. And the government is currently reviewing the longer term position with regard to no recourse to public funds families and school meals, but they've been taking a long time about it. And they say that um, they hope to publish some or hope to come up with their conclusions soon, but soon is a very elastic term in government uh, speak. Um, and I was also very pleased to read in the paper that apparently the government had backed down over the exclusion of no recourse to public funds families from the, the Healthy Start scheme uh, when they were taken to court over this. So uh, it shows that it, it, it is worth sometimes pushing on these, these matters. But it might, I mean, I don't know who is, who is carrying out this review in the Department for Education. In the, um, yeah, but it might be worth drawing to their attention the evidence from this, from your study of what it means when you do exclude these children from the school meal scheme and how important 
school meals are to um, uh, combating uh, food poverty. Uh, and the book uh, demonstrates the importance of school meals generally uh, and some of the problems with administration of them, which Julia uh, referred to. And then the book reminds us also of the need to understand poverty within a wider context of growing uh, financial and economic insecurity and labour market carity, which I think I've become more aware of and certainly pay more attention to in the second edition of my book. And thank you for the plug for that. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it helps to, to remind us that this is part of a spectrum. This isn't some sort of group that's completely different from the rest of society. Um, and it's important, I think, that social policies, be it social security, the labor market, housing, I think pay more attention to um, uh, insecurity. But I just wanted to finish with, I just noted in, um, you mentioned earlier Liz Dowler, who's played such an important role in, in um, drawing public attention to these issues. And I noticed she put in the chat how it's shaming that we're really having to discuss these issues over a century on from um, the Committee on Physical Deterioration in 1901. So thank you for that historical reminder. And I just hope that in another century, there won't be somebody else you know, on the um, future equivalent of Zoom, uh, having to draw attention to these issues. So again, thank you very much for doing the, the research and for, for the book. You're both on mute. <laughs> Sorry, sorry about that. Thank you very much, um, Ruth Lister. Um, Vasco Ramos, you're next. Uh, what can you tell us about the situation for the families that you worked with for the study in Portugal? Uh, hello, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, and thank you for inviting me and Monica to be here. I think she was here and now she disappeared, but she might be coming back. I would like to start to say it was a privilege and for me really a life-changing experience to be part of the of the team and, and of the research that led to Rebecca and, and Julia's book. So I will go back and I'll start by looking at the reasons why it seemed easier to find families in Portugal for this study compared to the UK and Norway. One of the reasons, uh, Julia already touched on this, is the, the extent of poverty in Portugal is especially for families with children. Uh, before the study in 2014, 27.5% of the population were at risk of poverty and figures are higher for single parent families, above 40% and couples with three or more children above 35%. So when we started field work in late to 2016, the situation had marginally improved only and there were plenty of families which fit fitted the criteria to be selected for the study. Another reason was the ability to work in cooperations with schools and uh, NGOs and even parish councils, which are the lower level administration uh, here in Portugal, in areas that are not overburdened with research. Certain areas here in Port Portugal have been subject to, they are suffering from research fatigue, I, I would say. Uh, we might say that luck was also involved and the promise of a 50 euro voucher for participants certainly helped. As work progressed, we realized that for many families, this amount covered a week or more of their food expenses. Finally, I think the research design methodology and communication was vital because it was not condescending or patronizing. It sought to hear, understand, cooperate, and this certainly helped in gaining trust from schools uh, families and the institutions that work with them. So uh, about the families that we spoke with and what do they, what do they eat? Um, and one point that it's important for comparison, and you already touched on that, uh, uh, Ruth Lister and Julia and even Rebecca spoke on this, um, the issue of school meals is really relevant here. So at school, children have access to a set menu uh, low-income families get them for free and the others uh, pay a maximum of one for 146 euros. So it's the maximum anyone pays. 
This menu always includes soup, a fish, meat, vegetarian dish with salad and or additional sides, plus a piece of fruit and, and bread. The components of this main course alternate, so it's fish one day, meat the, the next, sometimes both are available. And the actual composition of the menus is regulated by the Ministry of Education, which sets uh, nutritional standards and rules. For example, there are no fried foods, no sodas, and there is a minimum frequency of certain foods like egg, eggs or codfish, which is very uh, important here. So a sample menu consists of, uh, for example, julienne soup, broiled chicken with spaghetti and salad, plus an apple and uh, a piece of bread. Uh, within our sample, almost all children ate regularly at school. So at home, there were differences. Uh, the, f the, the foods eaten by low-income families that diverged depending on the severity of poverty, but also on their background. So the elements of the menus could be similar to the ones they had at school, but the proportions uh, were different. For families uh, that struggled the most, the meals included a lot of uh, rice, pasta and potatoes and fewer veg and pr protein. Uh, those that depended, uh, that, that relied most on the food bank ate many, uh, many meals that, that uh, were based on thin or canned foods. And overall, we found out that at home, families tended to eat a lot of pork and poultry, which are very cheap, and not much, if any, uh, fresh or dried fish, dried, uh, dried fish like cod, which is uh, one, uh, one mainstay of the Portuguese diet. So another thing that uh, I think it's important to speak on is about uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, on these families uh, or similar families. So like uh, in the UK and other countries, when the pandemic hit in March last year, um, a lockdown was declared almost immediately and schools were closed for a long time. Uh, some, some schools never returned to, to, to regular uh, operation until this year, uh, uh, the next year. So, so they re, um, reconvened in uh, September. So there were moments of panic and uh, families that relied on school meals struggled very hard. Uh, in some areas, the school uh, canteens were, were kept uh, serving takeaway meals. And in, in certain areas of the country, there were even home delivery services set, uh, established at schools. So they were uh, delivering foods to, to families. And the situation only returned to normal, to pre, uh, not, not pre, pre, uh, pre COVID, but to the regular fun function in September last year. But again, schools closed after the new year because we had a, a huge third wave here in the beginning of this year. And at that time, the, the food bank, the National Food Bank, it, it, it's, it's run by the, the Catholic Church or it's related to the Catholic Church. They reported a huge increase in the number of requests for help uh, as did city, city councils and parish councils. But uh, so far the data on emergency help is not very clear. So for the future, the evolution of employment and wages is vital to, to understand where we are going. So up to the pandemic, the econ economic recovery after the crisis, uh, uh, the financial crisis of the 2011-14 of the had been mostly supported by growth in hospitality and tourism industries. Many jobs were created in, in these sectors, but they mostly were low paying jobs. And these activities are being hit very hard by the pandemic and their recovery will be slow. Also, uh, in 2019, one out of seven uh, work of the working population here in Portugal were working poor. Uh, one third of families in Portugal have at least one uh, adult fully employed and many have two adults fully employed. So without emergency policy responses, single parent families uh, are certainly uh, likely to be affected very hard and as are families with two or more children uh, as before. So just to give you a, an idea, after the first lockdown last year, 40% of the working population here were on furlough. And as of last month, still about 1 million are on furlough or similar situation. And the unemployment rate as of April this year already increased 
uh, above what uh, we had in March last year before the pandemic. And debt is another concern. There are moratoria in place on family and corporate debt to deal with lower incomes and inactivity. And this will start to come to an end by next month. Uh, there are fears that a wave of bankruptcies and dismissals will increase uh, unemployment and affect poverty and families through, through that. While it is impossible to know what will happen, the scenario right now is very concerning. Thank you, Vas Vasco. Over to you, Sil Silje Skulant, and to Norway. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for having me here. And also thank you to the team, which has been uh, the greatest team to work with. I was very happy to be a part of this project, which felt very close to my heart from the beginning. Uh, and still does. Uh, and it's been nice to have a sort of dig into it again for this day today. So I will start off with uh, saying something about why it was really difficult to recruit in Norway, the opposite of, uh, of Portugal. Well, first of all, uh, poverty has been a term that has uh, meant something completely different for, for many years. Uh, uh, it has been a term that was actually said that we did not have any poor people in Norway due to the social democratic welfare state and, as you know, generous welfare schemes and also the idea that they are universal. So I think poverty was politically erased in the 1970s. It didn't exist. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, uh, after uh, 2000, it was a decision made by the uh, public to, uh, uh, to start measuring low income. And low income has been measured as uh, the EU scale. And then uh, suddenly uh, the politicians realized that there are some people with low income, but who are they? And do they really know themselves that they are of low income? Probably not. But, However, there are income differences in Norway and typically, as Julia said, single parents are uh, at risk of low income. In addition to that, uh, Norway uh, has quite a lot of uh, uh, refugees over the last 20 years and being uh, or uh, coming from another country, especially through the quota system, means that uh, uh, the risk of poverty is very high. So I think about 50% that has a, a, a refugee background is considered low income uh, statistically. And then the interesting question here is also, does food poverty exist in Norway? Because people in Norway, they are on social benefits if they are not working. And uh, all the research that has been done on young people and families uh, in terms of poverty, has said that uh, uh, poverty in Norway is not a material problem, it is actually a social problem. Uh, so the question I raised at least is, to, well, how can we say that it is poverty and say that it has nothing to do with food and costs and everything? So um, one of the things that uh, uh, we have to look at uh, in Norway is to look at not the income, but to look at the expenses. And housing prices in Norway is really high, especially in the, uh, the capital of uh, Oslo, uh, where housing prices might be 50% of disposable income. And of course, that has something to say with how much money you have for buying food. So in, in, in uh, looking for people, uh, I realized that I had to go far beyond the border. So uh, the initial plan, uh, and, uh, both in rural, in several rural areas and in several city areas. And I had to find people with uh, migrant backgrounds, with a refugee status at some point. Uh, and these are not easily accessible people to find. And I also had to redefine food poverty. I had to sort of ask people, well, uh, uh, is your housing cost very high? And how does that affect your, uh, uh, your food consumption? 
uh, and, and I, I managed to uh, recruit 12 Somali families by just asking the question, do you ever travel across the border to Sweden to buy food? Uh, and where, what people do in Norway. And among uh, the families that I interviewed, everyone went across the border to Sweden to shop for food. And the reason for that is, of course, that food in Sweden is much cheaper than in Norway. And in some areas in Oslo, you can join a bus for free and you can go to Sweden and you can buy your meat and your cheese and your uh, um, uh, rice and oils, whatever you need. So uh, uh, even though recruitment did take time and was, uh, 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 was uh, some challenges, I think we in the end uh, managed to interview some great families. So what kind of food does people and uh, do people eat in Norway? Well, I would like to say Swedish food, but, uh, but Swedish food is not so different than Norwegian food. So in, uh, as uh, Lasko said, in Portugal, there is uh, a school meal program and the same goes for the UK. In Norway, we have packed, packed lunches. And packed lunches is usually an uh, open sandwich with spread that is packed either in paper or in, in a meal box. Uh, so um, uh, that is what children eat at school. And it's supposed to be frugal in a sense. And I think it is a frugal way of eating if you are a couple and you both in work and uh, you have two children. But if you are a Somali family and you have six children, and uh, you don't really uh, have in your culture to eat all the bread that we have in the Norwegian uh, traditional culture, it might get quite expensive. So in, uh, during this project, I, I found out that the families, they actually uh, uh, find themselves in a better shape during vacations because then they wouldn't have to buy that many bread for the packed lunches. So uh, in terms of the COVID, I, I don't know how, how, uh, how the families that I uh, interviewed have coped, but I would guess that not needing to uh, buy bread and spread for the packed lunches is actually a, a money saver uh, when people have been outside school. Um, so and for um, it's very difficult to say something about what families eat uh, uh, in uh, in general because many of the people that I interviewed came from uh, uh, other uh, countries and they had brought their very nice food traditions to Norway and uh, and so meals were quite varied but one thing what they all had in common and that it was the starchy project product. And in uh, the uh, Somali uh, uh, families, it was a lot of rice, a way to, to pad out the meals. And in the uh, uh, Norwegian families, uh, they were more um, bread, uh, not during dinner, but potatoes and pasta, lots of pasta. Uh, um, so yes, and what has uh, happened uh, in uh, the COVID situation, well, uh, as in any country, uh, COVID has been a crisis here as well. But in Norway, we have not been that uh, affected by that many numbers of infections uh, as we have seen in Europe. Uh, and also we've uh, not had the same uh, uh, lockdown uh, or the same amount of time for lockdown as you've had across Europe. Uh, so therefore, uh, people of course have been furloughed and they have, uh, some have lost their jobs, but uh, uh, basically the, the harsh economic consequences we have not seen. But uh, referring to a couple of studies done by some colleagues of mine, uh, we realized very early on is that uh, having enough excess food is necessary in terms of uh, going to, if, if you have to quarantine. And uh, uh, a study made by a colleague of mine called Lisbeth Baig, she found out that 15% of uh, uh, the uh, respondents 
they had no excess food at home uh, in, uh, in case of a quarantine, and they had no family or friends uh, to help them out to buy food for them, and they had no uh, possibility financially to pay for online food. Uh, so that's one study. Another uh, study made by another uh, colleague of mine, Christian Koppa, he found that 8% uh, uh, of the of the uh, people suffered from financial problems uh, during COVID. And uh, among those was a high percentage of single parents. And as much as 50% uh, had uh, a challenging of uh, um, paying for food. Uh, and I think uh, about 15% said that uh, uh, they paid food with credit cards. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celia. Imogen Richmond Bishop, please. Thanks. I'm going to try and keep it uh, brief so that we've got some time for the Q&A afterwards. But I was asked um, to talk today about the right to food across the three nations, but I'll mainly be focusing on the UK because that's where I currently work. Um, so as some of you might know, um, successive governments from the UK, Norway and Portugal have all committed to the right to food on an international stage. However, unlike many other countries around the world, they haven't yet incorporated that right into their domestic legislation. Um, but however, there are some, some little things that are happening which are quite interesting. So in Portugal, the National Council for Food Security and Nutrition are currently drafting a national strategy. And just last month, they met with the UN Food and Agricultural Organization to look at what incorporating the right to food within that national strategy would mean. Um, the Norwegian government's action plan on sustainable food system, systems has pledged to strengthen human rights. And in particular, that includes the right to food as well as the right to health. Um, but in particular, this, this strategy is more focused on um, food production throughout the world, as well as the rights of marginalised people. And in the UK, as um, I'm sure many people listening in will be quite aware, there's relatively little action from the UK government on the right to food. However, there's significant grassroots action uh, from local groups all across the country, as well as um, from civil society. A number of local authorities have declared themselves to be right to food cities and areas, which is quite a strong um, commitment now. And the right to food was a policy commitment in four um, party manifestos in the last general election in 2019. But if you actually look at the UK, if you look more on a devolved level, so in Scotland, they're, they're much further along than the UK government. Um, just this year, the Scottish government has committed to a new human rights bill, which would incorporate four international human rights treaties into domestic legislation. And this would, of course, include provisions for the right to food. Um, so a lot's already been said around food access, so I won't really go into um, and that too much. Um, but first of all, I mean, really the right to food at, at its core is not about providing people with food aid. And that's, of course, not the goal. Um, it's about ensuring that all people are able to access food at all times. And it also includes provisions for looking at the food system. So that means looking at how the food is produced, the nutritional value of it, but also food workers and environmental concerns, which I think just looking at poverty wouldn't necessarily be bringing in. Um, one particular um, concern that we're looking at is how uh, various work, welfare and immigration policies impact on the right to food. So in particular, this um, a lot of my work is currently focused on the no recourse to public funds condition, which both Rebecca, Ruth and Julia have all mentioned. But this Im immigration condition is a particular barrier for people to access food and it really enforces destitution upon uh, migrants who are in particular women and people of colour. Um, so whilst you know there have been some policy changes that have happened quite recently around this, so including the extension for Healthy Start as well as preschool meals, um, these are very partial extensions, they're temporary extensions, but also they don't go to the root of what's causing food insecurity for these communities. Uh, so finally, just to, to wrap it up, I want to bring in one uh, particular concern. Um, so that's around budgetary decision making and austerity, in particular around privatisation. So obviously, um, these are all quite uh, big concerns in the UK at the moment. Um, so first of all, budgets and economic decision making, both are really a, form a key part of the right to food, because obviously in order to achieve this right, we need to have sufficient funds and sufficient allocation of funds to certain sectors. Um, both the UK, Norway and Portugal have all committed to this through the incorporation of various, um, through the ratification of various international legal standards. 
And what they've committed to do is basically allocate the maximum available resources to achieving these rights. So this will, what this means for different countries will, you know, mean different things, but it, it is basically that there's a baseline that we shouldn't be going underneath. Um, and there is some allowance um, for budget cuts within the maximum available resources and within international human rights provisions. But really, these um, shouldn't impact on the achievement of the right. And they also shouldn't disproportionately impact marginalized groups or protect people with protected characteristics like we've seen in the UK. Um, furthermore, privatization is increasingly being used by governments who are undertaking austerity policies. And sort of the justification behind that is that by privatizing, it will reduce public spending. However, what we've seen is that actually it increases public spending and it also delivers um, a subpar service. Um, so that means that it's sort of doubly, doubly negative. Um, just to really conclude on one last example of uh, the impact of privatization. I don't know if people remember back in January when the schools were closed, um, children who were receiving free school meals were given food parcels before the voucher scheme got back up and running. So the children who received these private um, food parcels, I mean, I'm sure many people might have seen it in the news or in, in photos, but you know, there was like a third of a carrot, there was a few slices of bread, there was a chunks of cheese. I mean, I think one particular example that really stuck out to me was there was, you know, a tablespoon of baked beans put in a little bag that's normally used to count coins. So not only is this not hygienic, it's not dignified, it's not nutritionally balanced, it's also just, it wasn't simply enough food for a child to live off for a week. So obviously, and then if you compare those with the parcels that were provided by local authorities that were full of the fresh food, that were nutritionally balanced, and also, you know, there was care that went into it. I think you can really see the contrast between private services and in-house, but then also drawing out from that. I mean, obviously a cash first approach is generally the best approach for most families. Um, so there's that. Um, and then I think just to conclude, if you are based in the UK, there is a parliamentary petition that is closing tomorrow that's um, been put together by fans supporting food banks. Um, I'll put the link in the chat, but if you're able to sign and share that, that would be great. Um, so I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Imogen. <laughs> Um, we'd like to bring in the audience now, and we already have a few questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So I'm going to cluster three of them now and, and ask um, Stephanie Motzek, Eileen O'Keefe and Alicia Weston to put their questions. They, I, I gave you permission to talk so you can use your microphones. Please um, say very briefly um, uh, what your affiliation is and keep your questions very brief so we can hear the answers and keep it to one question each, please. Um, Stephanie Motzik, could you go first? Um, I'm trying to keep my baby under control, so I'd like... <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I am affiliated with Fair Share and um, I'm writing my thesis at the moment and I'm exploring the narratives around uh, food poverty specifically. And I was wondering if you could comment about the role of food surplus uh, for food poverty and if it really hinders any, um, it's contributing to the inaction of um, policy. And also um, if you could comment on the framing of supermarkets and other food retailers as the heroes because they've been donating so much food surplus um, to the food poverty issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eileen O'Keefe. Hello, I'm Eileen, um, Professor uh, Emeritus at London Metropolitan University. And I'd be interested in a development of the idea that we need a multi-level food strategy that does take into account the national level, regional level and local level for the UK. You have, I, I know Rebecca and Julia have been interested in that and I'd like more detail about that and a further relation to that is the question of whether we can use the women's budget group thinking about how to produce good food jobs for women from farm to fork. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alicia Weston. Hi, um, yeah, I'm the CEO of an organization called Bags of Taste. 
Um, and we work with thousands of people in food poverty to improve their diets. Um, what I'm interested in is the whole issue of class and food. As somebody who's lived and worked in eight countries um, around the world, um, I noticed that the issue of shame um, around the kind of food that people eat um, is much worse here in the UK than in other countries. I would say actually broadly it's an Anglo-Saxon thing is, is my observation. Um, but I'd be really interested to know what you found, you know, comparing across three different countries you would agree with me on that. But it seems to me that there is poor food in this country that isn't always the case in other countries. Great. And one last question, please, from Isabel, um, or Isabel, um, before we hand over to the panel. Isabel, brief, please. Oh, uh, thank you. I want to know uh, how the researchers uh, reflect uh, on the idea which methods that they use, they use uh, for the research and um, what they choose in the, this big generating data to put uh, in the book and what they decide just keep it in their own books instead of being published. Many thanks. Thank you. Julia and Rebecca, please pick and choose. Well, we can pick and choose. We can also suggest that there's other experts here who might be better placed to answer some of those questions. <laughs> but we maybe start with the last question, yes. from Isabel. Thank you. Um, on deciding what to include in the book, it, it's really difficult um, to decide what to include. And I think that whenever you do research, anybody who does research feels that they haven't covered as much of the material as they might do or possibly could do. But what we hoped to do was to give an indication of the over, overall spread of, of, of the different um, outcomes that we found within the sample and then focus on particular types of families. And we selected those types of families because they were either the focus of policy interest or they've been neglected from policy. So in the case of lone, lone mother families, as Ruth mentioned, we have this question of actually why lone mother, why have lone mother families fallen out of the kind of public discussion? Um, perhaps it's to do with using, you know, the non-gender terminology of parenting. I, I don't, I don't know, but I suspect that's part of it. Um, so that was one of, we chose to focus on particular cases and then we tried to match them on some criteria, on some aspects of, of, of some of their characteristics across across the, the countries and use that to help us to explain that you know the differences that social context made but it was very it is very difficult to decide what to focus on I'm just going to ask Julia which I'm sure she'll want to add something on that well only to say that I think one has a a, a duty to do um, justice to the breadth and depth of the data and I think we tried to do that. And I think the, it, it, it's, it's not just the presentation. I think um, what Rebecca was talking about underlay our original uh, methodology. Mm. So, you know, it was a, a kind of um, not so much a choice as, as um, it's something we had to follow through on, if you like. We could have ducked out of it, but we didn't chose what to do. Um, I, I think also thank you for all of your questions and I realise we've only got five minutes so I would quickly suggest that I wondered if Celia or Vasco wanted to say anything about um, you know there is this idea in the UK that we well you know and some evidence that we we do all of us whether we're on high or low incomes eat particularly badly and um, I wanted to uh, and you know we very um, steep kind of social gradient in terms of health and, and diet but I wondered if you wanted to say something about food um, and either social class or income um, in in Norway and Portugal you said something about it already but any other reflections on differences in diet or how they're understood Celia I think that um in Norway, uh, uh, nutritional inequalities is very well uh, 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 mentioned by uh, in public media, 
and it's always related to uh, uh, educational differences. And therefore, it tends to have this uh, idea that people eat uh, poorly because of their poor education. But this uh, is obviously also a question of how much money you can spend. And uh, food prices have been rising quite sharply, and especially for the nutritious fruit and vegetables. Um, and in Norway, uh, income has sort of been taken out as a variable when you do those nutritional uh, studies. So in the end, you're individualizing uh, uh, inequalities and food poverty, actually. You're doing it to a knowledge level. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Vasco, I, I guess it's to do with adherence to the Mediterranean diet would be the kind of discussion. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about it. I, I already mentioned in a conversation with you that, uh, for example, here in Portugal, uh, there, there is this idea and the nutritionists and, and others uh, in the field, um, they measure the, what they call adherence to the Mediterranean diet, which you probably know what it is. Um, but for example, right now, uh, a kilo of red peppers is more expensive than a kilo of, of pork or poultry. So, and uh, the pork uh, and poultry, they, they factor in the Mediterranean diet, but in a small proportion. And when you think of feeding a family, uh, for example, a, fam a family of, with, two, two, with two kids, uh, <laughs> factoring a kilo of peppers or a kilo of, of, of pork or poultry to feed them, you, you, you do the math. What, what, is more, what is more relevant for, for family? So there are huge inequalities in, in, in in food consumption here in Portugal, they, they probably have not been addressed sociologically to the extent that they deserve. And this, the work that we did is a, a step in this direction. Uh, I think there is more awareness of this fact in the UK because you have, you have, you have a, a, a broader uh, academic uh, community working in the field. Uh, in Portugal, the, the situation also exists uh, but it hasn't been addressed so far. Thank you. Thank also, I think going back to the, um, the, the person who asked this question, it, I mean, there isn't a ubiquitous Anglo-Saxon diet in, in Britain, which is a very diverse country. And if you look in, in our book, you'll see that um, although um, people who learned how to cook and came from other countries um, did try very you know they did use uh, and cook with vegetables that they bought in local markets if they could could find them uh, and cook it in, in 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 very healthy ways so it, it is a very diverse picture Thank you. We actually have one minute left and two questions that we haven't even touched on from Eileen and um, and sorry, I haven't got the name of uh, the first person who asked a question on fair share and the narrative Thank around. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the narrative around supermarkets and surplus and um, the response to to food poverty. I, I thought Imogen might want to comment on on that aspect and then perhaps Ruth, do you want to say anything about the the women, the, the women's budget group um, that Eileen mentioned. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and keep it keep it quick. Um, so yeah, so around the question around food waste and food poverty. So obviously, in my mind, at least food waste is an environmental issue, and food poverty is a poverty issue. So they are two distinct issues, and one you know you could one's not going to solve the other. Um, and I think it's quite a, it's quite problematic to frame one as the answer to the other and really to overplay the connection between um, both of them. And I think in particular, you know, supermarkets, are they paying a living wage to their staff? Are they paying a living wage to food producers? You know, they're having a, an outsized role potentially in causing food poverty. Um, so I think that also needs to be taken into account. Um, so I think I'll keep it there, but get in touch if you want to discuss this more, Stephanie. I'm always happy to. Thank you. Um, I I'm not sure I can answer on the women's budget group in terms of, um, I mean, I'm not quite sure what food jobs, what, what's referred to in that, but I just did want to make a point which perhaps was um, related to the other unanswered question, and that is that, I mean, again, it's a dilemma. I mean, on the one hand, 
you know, food charities, be it surplus, so-called surplus food, which I mean, the point has been made in the chat is, is that can be a rather demeaning term, um, or food banks. On the one hand, you know, they are helping people in the here and now. But on the other hand, there is a real danger that they become normalised as part of the welfare state um, and takes the pressure off the politicians to, to provide adequate benefits um, in particular, but also to, to tackle uh, food poverty more generally. So it's a, it's a balancing act, but um, I think there is growing recognition that food banks are not an answer, that it's actually now an all-party parliamentary group on how to end reliance on food banks, and it is serviced by the Trussell Trust because they are themselves saying, you know, we should not have to exist. So I think it's really important to remember that when, when that sort of balancing act. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and Eileen, on, on the multi-level food strategy, I think it sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> I think we'll have to think about it a bit more, maybe talk about it. Does anybody else want to comment on that, on that question? I would say just in the UK, on there's, you know, the national food strategy that's being developed that does have a multi-level angle to it. Um, so I'd suggest getting in touch with the team there. The second um, part of that report will be coming out soon. Thanks, Imogen. Thank you. Um, thank you all for managing to answer all the questions with only two minutes over running. Um, thank you for all our speakers. It's been a fascinating insight into your works on, on all, from, all in, from all your different perspectives. Um, do read the book and thank you all for joining us today. Congratulations to the team and the authors. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming and speaking. Bye. Bye.